Hi, this is Joe Polish uh, doing a very awesome Genius Network interview that I'm so looking forward to. I've got Mr. Hugh Downs. Uh, Hugh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. We're going to do an interview here. I'm going to ask you about your life. Uh, if you don't know who Hugh Downs is, you've probably been living in a closet for the last uh, however many years. But nonetheless, I'm going to go through a couple of highlights. He's a longtime anchor of ABC's uh, television primetime news magazine 2020, which I was on on the very last year. Uh, and you did that for many years. I'll ask you about that. Uh, he's one of the most familiar figures in television history. Uh, up until 2004, he was on television over 15,000 hours. I think Regis Philbin is, is kind of now surpassed how much time on it, television. It, yeah, I should explain that the, the Guinness Book of World Records record still stands if you use the words uh, primetime commercial television. Uh, because Regis Philbin and two others I can mention through syndication or locally were on longer than I was. Right. But I still have the record for the, uh, uh, for the most on, uh, on network commercial television. That's great. And you've been doing this for 66 years. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm still doing it, but not regularly now. I'm staying away from regular work. Wow. Well, okay, I'll point out a couple more things for our viewers. And then, so, yeah, you got the world record. Uh, you've been, you started in radio and went on the television as a reporter, newscaster, interviewer, narrator, all kinds of stuff. I uh, received many awards, including six Emmys uh, and other awards like the Broadcaster of the Year and the National Media Award for Excellence in Long-Term Healthcare Reporting. Uh, you also helped launch the NBC Tonight Show in 1957 and anchored the Today Show from 1962 to 1971. I was just like three years old when you stopped doing that. Uh, authored many books. Um, he's an avid sailor and accomplished pilot. And we were just talking on the drive up here that uh, you're going to go back and get your renewal of your yeah, pilot license at 87 years old, which is pretty good. day current. Yeah, that's very good. Unbelievable. And in 1999, Arizona State University upgraded its communications department into a school now bearing the name the Hugh Downs School of Human Communication of which he is a frequent visitor and lecturer at the university. He and his wife, Ruth, are happily married. And as of February 2008, they've been married for 64 years and live in Arizona. They have two children, Hugh Raymond and Deidre Lynn, two grandchildren, uh, Leah Downs Harb and Carmen Black, and now uh, two great grandsons and a great granddaughter. And you have this it's book even that you wrote, your most recent one, Letter to a Great Grandson. Yeah, I had fun. That really was a letter to him, but it was made into a book. And I left it, I left it as a letter. I didn't, I didn't clean it up or anything. I just, right. It's just a very personal book. Well, it, yeah, and you can, you can get a copy of that from Amazon. You can track it down. Well, Hugh, there's so many things you've done. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. What are some uh, highlights of, of who you are uh, that you'd like to, to point out uh, that I didn't mention? You know, I wonder, I, uh, my wife, I do confess to being a generalist. I'm interested in a lot of things. It's right. a little bit like what Alexander Wolcott once said. He said, I'm interested in everything except incest and folk dancing. Right. And I said, that's kind of where I am, really. I'm interested in everything. And my wife I, I, I calls me a generalist, but she defines a generalist as somebody who comes to know uh, less and less about more and more until he knows nothing about everything. And I said, right. I think that's about where I am. What well, I, I mean, there's one area where you're you're just a complete expert, which is in communication. I mean, this is well, how I have you, focused on that. That's true. If that's you would, true. if you had to identify your core expertise out of all the things you know, and yeah, you do know a tremendous amount. When I was just even researching you, um, it's amazing how expansive your knowledge base is. I've been fascinated by communication, really, because it, it it is. It's what it's all about in human relationships. There's no doubt about that, you know. Uh, and it's useful if you have communication techniques, and no matter what you choose as a as a walk of life, you know, engineering or uh, law or whatever, right. knowing communication is important, and that's why I'm kind of proud to be connected with that school. What what what, what makes a, what makes a good communicator or a great communicator? I think establishing a rapport with with another human being in a way that is honest and as powerful as you can make it, and and uh, way it sounds corny, but if if it's at the very the least bit of self-serving that you have, that's that's good because if you're if you're out to do it all for yourself, you're going to fail. First of all, you won't communicate right, and secondly, you won't establish relationships that you want. Right. So you have to be open to that and and vulnerable and uh, and still get across whatever you want to get across in an honest way. Well, I, I mean, I remember reading uh, reading something you had said where, in I don't know how many years ago this was, but you said my 
my customer, I guess, I don't know if this is your exact words, but is the audience. It's not the networks, it's the actual audience. Yeah, and, sure. and at the time, you said that even went against what some people believed in, but you always felt the person that you were catering to was the viewer, the exactly. listener. Exactly. My first allegiance was to that person tuned in. Right. You know, and, and then after that, to the product or the network or whatever. And I did have an argument with an agency guy one time, and he said, well, you don't know where the bread's buttered. And I said, the bread would not be buttered for me at all if, if I lost faith. So, you know, if the people didn't believe that I believed what I was saying. Right. And that, so I adopted that as a means of operation. Wow, wow. Well, you've, you've done news reporting and journalism for, I mean, God, years, 66 years. You started in radio. Um, how does journalism and news reporting today compared to where it was 20, 30 years ago? There are some interesting differences, really, and not all of them are good. I think, the, first of all, technically it's improved vastly, as, as you know. Um, from the standpoint of, where, of how it operates, I think it's deteriorated to this extent. Competition made it, made, it got so fierce, finally, right. that in order to get better ratings, better circulation for print and whatnot, you had to kind of lean toward going toward that arena audience that tunes in for blood and dirt. You can get fast ratings that way, right. but you won't last as well as if you take a longer, a, a longer view. And I think that it's important uh, to recognize the fact that we went a little downhill that way when we, when we uh, got so competitive. When I started 2020, 1978, you had to have a share in the low 40s or mid 40s to be respectable. By the time I left, 21 years later, you, a share in the low 20s was more than respectable. Because when I left 2020, we had a share of 21, and the competition had 17 and 11. What does that even but, mean, a share? A, a share means a percentage of people tuned in who have their television sets on that are tuned to you. Okay, you know, if half of them are, you've got started. a 50 share. That's right. And so 21%. The reason we had so little at the end was that pie got sliced so much thinner and thinner wow. that, uh, you know, originally when I, when I first went into television, there were three television network. No, there were two television. ABC wasn't quite on the air yet. And a couple of independents. And that would be a choice of five channels maybe in a community. Look at the choice we've got now with cable and right. with everything. So th 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 the pie does get sliced thinner, and that's one of the big differences in the media today. Well, what do, what do you actually, where do you get your uh, information from? I know you've read a tremendous amount of books. You've written 11 or 12 books. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've finished 11 books now. and, and that, uh, okay. But my, my information comes largely, uh, I get a lot of news information from television. Uh -huh. And, and a lot, I, I must say CNN has been a, a pretty good source. for. I'll, I'll tell you something later about that because it made some changes after Turner no longer owned it. Right. But... Um, that and um, and um, local newspapers and and the New York Times I, I try to keep up with and that's about the way I, I, I have found out though that the world goes on even if I've missed a day of, of, of following what the journalists say it, it doesn't make a big difference <laughs> well, do, I mean, do you watch a lot is. of TV not a lot no okay. I, I try to catch some news I just don't have time to watch television like I did once so I can't really judge what the television fair generally is right anymore um, but that's, I try to keep up with the news in some ways. What, what, do you, what do you recommend for people? There's, we are in a, a current uh, age where there's more data inputs and we're so over-communicated to. I mean, how, and, and most people, I don't know if it's just my perspective, but it seems to me um, 10 years ago people were nowhere near as stressed or at least crazy busy as yeah. they are today. And I think it's simply because of the Internet and, and, and communication. I mean, You're right. what, what are recommendations do you have for people to stay tuned in but not you know go nuts with trying to pay attention to so many I know and obviously one of the things that has caused the polarization in our community now is the fact that so much is available that if a person gravitates only toward that ideology or that the source right. that he wants to believe in then he, he kind of misses out on the perspective and that right. can happen uh, at both ends of the spectrum my advice would be to anybody that really wants to know what's going on is to broaden the scope of what you take in and then make judgments. And I think smart people do that to a large extent. So that even though it is, as you said, overwhelming, uh, I used to think there was such a thing as information overload. Uh -huh. I really don't think that now. All you got to do is watch an early teenager uh, working a computer, right? You know, and and maybe maybe listening to music <laughs> at the same time, and the information isn't overloading him. It it can overload you a little later on, 
And if you get lost in that labyrinth and don't make judgments and, and decisions, then you, you get overwhelmed. But um, people who have anything on the ball are not going to be overwhelmed by it. Well, I, 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 remember, uh, I remember you, I'm trying to think who, who you actually were talking to about it. You said that you think one of the most crucial things of keeping your mind sharp was just having a lot of different interests in a lot of different areas. I think that's true because it, I, know I admire people who are single purpose. A brain surgeon who is really good and devotes all his attention to that, that's commendable. But that makes him more vulnerable. If you've got a lot of interests, and I've seen people in my business, in television, who, when they were forcibly retired or elected, to, uh, they they got bored and they didn't know what to do with themselves. I can't imagine being bored. Oh, I can't. There was a forty-hour day, you know, and I was, uh, and I had nothing else to do but but sit and think or read. Or, uh, I can't imagine being bored. Uh, so it's important, I think, to uh, to keep active mentally. And it, the brain is like a muscle. That's a cliche observation, but it, if you don't use it, it's going to kind of atrophy. Well, you've you've done a tremendous amount of work with just helping uh, people, older people, uh, however you you uh, define it, uh, live better lives, uh, understand their purpose. I mean, what would be some of your tips and recommendations as people get older to keep themselves totally mentally sharp? I mean, here you are, 87. Uh, years old. When I, I live here in, in Arizona, so when I went to pick you up today, you know, I, I was getting there a little early. I called, and your wife said, "Well, he'll be back here at 9:30." So you're right, <laughs> oh, yeah, doing something this morning. You have morning, appointments yeah. this afternoon. I mean, you stay yeah. very active, yeah. and I mean, you're you're clearly a very sharp individual, and you're physically, you know, in, in fantastic shape. I mean, Lucky. at least it, it, it appears uh, that way to me. Um, I mean, what are some tips and recommendations that you would have that would be significant life? Well, changes. a realization that you can mitigate uh, hazards. Uh, you can you can um, influence your longevity and your comfort and everything b b by habits that you clean up. When I was 25 years old, I thought it was a normal adult human condition to feel bad. I really did. Really? When I remembered when I was 15, I felt good all the time. Uh -huh. If somebody had said when I was 25 and didn't feel good. Uh, when you're 45 and 65 and 75 and even even 85, you will feel about like you did when you were 15. I would not have believed them, but the, I was too dumb to realize why I felt bad at 25. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, I had a diet that would uh, would have not been good for a hog, really. <laughs> and I wasn't getting enough sleep, and I drank too much. And, and I got that all cleaned up in a in short order through the help of my wife, and with a decent regimen, I realized you can influence very heavily right. what how your well-being is, how you feel, or how long you're going to make it. Right. Uh, so I would advise that let nobody uh, adopt the idea that they're going to die young because an ancestor died young. That's not necessarily true. Right. Uh, you you can do things to make things better, and uh, if people realize that, they start doing them. Well, you said a really important thing, which is you adopted a regimen that just turned it all around. I mean, what uh, what what was the happiest time of your your life or your career? Oh well, probably at points in 2020, because that was that was not just because it was the last, but it was because. It was where I belonged, really. I'd done a, I once said to somebody, a newspaper interviewer said, uh, I said, I've done everything there is to do in my end of my business except play-by-play -play sports. And then I realized as soon as I said it, that wasn't true. Because in 1939, I broadcast a boxing match on radio, blow by blow. Wow. <laughs> Mercifully, no recording of that still exists because it was pretty awful, I imagine. But I've done even play-by-play -play sports. So um, I was. I, I imagine that being a generalist, I belonged on 2020, and I felt that was where I felt was most comfortable because it was news, but it wasn't headline news in little snatches that you had to go on from one to another. You could get in depth in a thing and do a news feature, and I loved doing that. Well, some high points there. That I mean, all the time that you spent doing news reporting, do you think it's gotten better, worse, or is it just kind of the same? Well, of some of it's, some of it's pretty good, but I think it, in some ways it has it has slipped uh, because of the competition. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the competition got a little fiercer than it ought to be, and then you ask yourself, how how will we mitigate that? If, do you want the government really running that? Right. No. <laughs> uh, free enterprise is still the best way, but a proper regulation of free enterprise, and I would like to see the, uh, uh, the FCC a little uh, less supinely weak than they've been on some points, uh, but I think a proper, a proper um, 
supervision of what's going on, and then allow allow the free enterprise aspects to flourish because that's what that's what keeps capitalism alive. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on capitalism? I I love capitalism. I mean, my good friend Dan Sullivan says you know. Um, the problem with capitalism is that it was named by its enemies. You know, capitalism is... Yeah, I know. It sounds like a bad, a bad word. Exactly. Right? And the funny thing is, no, capitalism is the basis of the best governments have ever existed on the planet. Mm -hmm. But laissez-faire capitalism is in danger of racking itself to pieces by lack of supervision. And then greed will take over. And you get if you get increasingly, this is simplistic, but if you get increasingly small number of extremely wealthy people and an increasing big number of very poor, you're right. headed for a revolution of some kind, right. which is not good. I think what made America great was we had antitrust legislation. We had all the things in place that would keep capitalism healthy, even for the wealthy. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, when, when you look at, you, I can't blame if a CEO makes a lot more money than his average worker, 300, 400 times as much. That's okay. He may be worth that. But 30,000 times as much, and that has, that has existed in the United States. For a guy to make 30,000 times as much as his worker that is, uh, is doing the right, work for him right. isn't right. And I think that was pointed out by Warren Buffett uh, at, one, at one point. Well, you know, I mean, considering what's going on in the economy right now at the time that we're doing this interview, I mean, what are your thoughts on, um, in terms of what people can do? I think ultimately we're most responsible for our own situation, you know, not relying on the government, not relying on no, other people right. to come and take care of us. What are some recommendations in terms of mindset and attitudes and behaviors that people that you think, uh, if they adopted them, yeah. would give them the highest possibility of succeeding in this wonderful country that we live in? I wish I had a formula for that. You know, it's like saying, don't worry. How can you right. tell somebody not to worry? But if, if it can be done, uh, and some self-help books point to this, I think. If it can be done that you can adopt a view that will be useful to you in really moving you toward uh, toward taking responsibility for your own actions and all of these things it, it may light a little fire that you you can nurture into a bonfire and right. it would it would uh, save your life and make life a lot more comfortable for you I, as i say i don't have a formula for that but uh, people who want to do it uh, and want to badly enough will probably do it but well let me ask you about like, what are some people maybe some books maybe some insights that just were significant to you in your life that really helped direct the course of your actions it, it, that's interesting one of the most interesting i think was reading uh, on uh, two sources of stoicism and that was uh, marcus aurelius uh, uh, and epictetus uh -huh. And from it, I learned some things I, I would never have believed. I was in my mid-20s when I, when I read the first of those. That, and it, I woke up to the fact you don't have to hate anybody. You know, you, you may deplore and hate something they've done that is wrong, but you don't hate the person. Because somebody once said, I read this someplace too, that hate is a weapon we wield by the blade. Right. And you just hurt yourself if, if you hate. So getting away from hate is important, but since we don't hate anything that we don't th that we don't fear, uh, people who are afraid of certain things will come to hate people who are associated with those things, and education is a big factor in in um, eliminating that. So I'm all behind good educational policies, uh, uh, but I otherwise I don't. That was one of the things that, that changed my life was to learn that you don't have to hate anybody. You know, uh, epi I don't know if I say it right, epititis or epititis. Uh, epictetus, yeah. Uh, the, the Art of Living, I think, is one of the most amazing books that I've ever read mm. in my entire life. Real thin, thin little book, yeah. but uh, my, my buddy, uh, Dr. Edward Holloway, is a great, uh, oh, yeah, a great a... Uh, uh, psychiatrist uh, who wrote a book called Crazy Busy. And that's one of the books he actually recommends for people today just to kind of, you know, calm down and not... not... You, you said something I heard you say once. Is I don't know, it's one of your friends. He said there's... Uh, the difference between being stressed and being distressed. I got that from Hans Selye, who's a Canadian physician, but I thought it made a lot of sense. Uh, stress is not bad. Right. Distress is. And uh, again, the muscle analogy, if you, if you stress a muscle by, by exercising, you're going to build that muscle. If you overdo it and tear the muscle, that's distress. And you shouldn't do that psychologically either. You know, the, the distress is a bad thing to have to suffer. Um, 
Uh, there are ways around that uh, by experts that know a lot more about that field than I do, but I think uh, there is a big difference between stress and distress. Oh, I, th I think it's profound. I mean, because yeah, yeah. it could be your your uh, it could be a great asset or it could be your worst enemy. It could you know destroy your life. Well, let's let's talk about r relationships and such. Yeah. I mean, you uh, you now have a, a great family. You've been married. How many years have you been married? Well, in in uh, February of 2009, it'd be 65 years uh, wow. since we got married. Well, then the obvious question is uh, tips, suggestions. Yeah. What's the secret, if there is one? The the secret is probably over 90 percent luck, because <laughs> when we met, we were very young. We didn't know each other. You know, people who fall in love don't know each other. You come to know each other if you establish a relationship. Being totally mysterious about each other, I could have been an abuser. She could have been a snake. You know, was, and as it turned out. I found she had something more important than her beauty and attractiveness was was character because right. she she has a lot of character and she thinks I have a lot of it so let's not disabuse her <laughs> and then that allowed us to grow together and to get over some things that in early in marriage we had some stormy times in the very early moments you do you know but we determined to to stay together and we finally got to a point where we could ventilate irritation without rancor. Ventilate irritation without rancor. That's really important that's because if you don't ventilate irritation, it's going to build up and that's, that's awful. Right. And if you do it with rancor, then you're going to tear something that you don't want to have, have to repair later. But we got to a point early on where we could, either one of us could say something to the other one like, uh, well, you idiot, if you hadn't put the potholders in the microwave or whatever. Right. And it all is kind of funny. And it, even if we criticize each other, we wind up laughing. Right. And I think laughing is very important in a marriage. Oh, you know, I think laughing in general. I mean, when I look at people that are sitting across from each other having dinner and they don't not saying anything to each other, they have these sour looks on their faces. <laughs> I think you can gauge the quality of a relationship by how often they laugh. I think it. you're right. You're right. There's a, somebody did a study at ASU about marriage. Uh, couples and what they what percentage of time they spent talking about the children's education about finance about uh, and what percentage of time they spent in laughter and it came out to a, close to one percent and my wife and I looked when we got that result we did wow. a speech on that but, uh, we we looked at each other and said we must do about 18 percent of our married time is laughing you know laughing at each other right. and with each other and everything but, but I, I think that's an important uh, who's factor. funnier you or her <laughs> That's a good question, and she might answer it differently from me. I don't know. Uh, I, I like to think I have something of a sense of humor, but she's got a great sense of humor. No, I, I, I think I actually I think you've got a great sense of humor. Well, um, so mentors, uh, people that you've yeah. looked up to in life, uh, who who were some of those people to you? And uh... well, oddly, uh, a lot of people that I read, and some no longer living, obviously, or weren't even when I was born, but. In the family, my my dad was a great uh, a great inspiration to me because he he, uh, he kept us through the depression without ever going hungry, and that was the Great Depression was great. I mean, it was right. very big, you know. Right. And uh, we so I didn't suffer any trauma like that because even when the banks all closed in 1932, I was 11 years old, and my mother called us in and said, "I've got bad news." And I thought maybe some cherished relative had died or something. Right. She said, the banks have closed and you're probably not going to see your money again. Well, I had $11 in an account that I thought they were going to make me spend on school supplies or something. I couldn't care less. I went out and played. So here I had that, I was cushioned against the awfulness of what the depression was going to be in. And, and as I say, never went hungry, but we didn't have any frills. Right. And so, and my dad's attitude toward that was interesting. He, he, he had a way of explaining things that, that uh, impressed me. This is maybe worth mentioning. I, I asked him questions like, you know, the old tree falls in the forest, is there a sound? And yeah. he said, well, he was very scientifically minded. He said, you define sound. If sound is just the expansion and rarefaction of the wave train of air, and there's no, nothing, no ears to hear, then there's a sound. If if the sound, if sound is a, uh, that kind of train going on a, a eardrum and an auditory nerve, and there's nobody there of that nature to hear it, then there is no sound. I thought that was very simple. The, another one that he had disabused me of was, a, what happens really if the irresistible force meets the immovable object? You know, and he said that's a real. And he said this is a, a non-problem. He said. If there exists an irresistible force, that precludes any immovable object and vice versa. So it's a non-problem. And it just it was solved like that for him. 
And I thought, isn't that amazing? Things that puzzle other people endlessly, and he just had it solved. Well, is that is he the one that, that created your interest in science? Yes, he, he is indeed. When I was five years old, and I remember this, I asked him how far away the moon was. <laughs> and I, rem I remember that he said it was 238,000 miles away. Well, you know, at five years old, I didn't know what 238,000 miles was. But I was so flattered to be given an adult answer to a question of mine that that triggered an interest in science in me. Because, you know, many fathers would have said, well, we'd have to stand on the kitchen stool to reach it or something. Right, you know? right. And he gave me an honest scientific answer as if I was grown up enough to understand it. And that was very worthwhile to me. Do you, do you think that people, the way they talk to children like their kids is, is bad? Often. Often it's not good. You've got to give honest answers. And For example, I remember in both my parents' case, when I was in the first grade in school, I remember kids that were in school that had some weird ideas about sex, you know, and uh -huh. I thought, well, what's the matter? Where do they get Let's these hear about weird these ideas? ideas. No, Bec I'm kidding. Well, and, and my parents would never explain more than they needed to, but uh -huh. if I asked a question, they'd give me an, answer, uh, an honest answer, right. me and my brothers. And the result was we never thought it was a big deal. I mean, it, it, there's never any time later on of a talk about the birds and the bees, because that's nonsense. You've got to bring a child along as needed and, uh, and leave it at that. And that's what my parents, and that's what my wife and I did for our kids. Well, and those it, kids did for their kids. Well, what about you? You have a you have a great grandson. I mean, yeah. uh, you have. Uh, you, you, what what's your parenting advice for people out there? Parenting advice would would be first of all, you've got to want uh, children and and love them. Uh -huh. Once you do that, then it's, a, it's on the job training, because there are books that you help you steer away from uh, some awful pitfalls, but otherwise you learn as you go, because you, you've got to do what's best. And if you're motivated by what's best for the child, you'll do the right things, I think. That's my best advice. Okay, great. Well, um, in terms of reading and education, what has been, uh, and what do you feel today is some of the most significant things that people can invest their time and attention on that would really benefit them in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their behavior? One thing that helped me a lot, uh, Joe, was uh, the, the great books, which came out originally in uh, Stringfellow Bar and Scott Buchanan at uh, St. John's, came out with the great books list, and it was just right. called the great books. Later, um, it was the it was Britannica put it out and had the good taste to say the great books of the Western world because there's an awful lot of Eastern right. stuff that isn't even translated yet, but that that book I was inc incidentally I was very flattered to be because I had read the great books starting in 1944 I was going to do it in seven years and it took me 14 years, but I because uh, I read twice other as long too yeah. yeah but I uh, that was better than the college education the great books and now the great books of the Western world which are available I mean on, you can get them electronically and everything right. uh, I reading through that was very worthwhile to me to get a, a look at the minds of the great minds of uh, antiquity and on up into modern times uh, I I probably got more benefit from that than any other kind of reading course I could think of and still have time to, have time to read other things. Wow. Well, well, I mean, you, you have uh, interviewed presidents. You've interviewed so many different people. Uh, I'd love to hear your philosophies on the founding fathers that started this country and what, what are some of the principles that guided them. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Doesn't that get more impressive? The more time goes by and the more I examine it against the troubles that the nation has from time to time. What inspired them to be able to do, one of the things I think was a cooperation between youth and age. You know, at the time you had fiery minds from 19 and early 20s forming the, the principles of the United States, working with a guy who was over 80 when the Constitution was adopted, right. Benjamin Franklin, and they had respect for each other. We, we, that began to go because there, there was a tendency for the young to call the old old fogies you know and for the old to say well the young are just wet behind the ears and they don't know what they're doing but they had a, that cooperation and they somehow managed to put together principles that not only were right for humanity i think to, for in a long-term democracy but were were destined to be capable of enduring Right. And uh, we, we, if we can run our country that way, we will endure. And so that we get rid of the idea that the might of America is in its military or its, or its wealth, and in the, but rather in the principles on which it was founded and to a large extent operates. 
that's that's hope for a, a democracy that can go on more or less indefinitely. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, okay, let's talk about some uh, some life challenges, some obstacles. What are some of the uh, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges that you've had to deal with in your life? Because I'd love to hear how you overcame uh, difficulties. What would the biggest challenge I think would be? Well, for one thing, I, I, I had to overcome, and I, I don't think I ever did, a lethargy when it came. Who was a writer that said the wor most frightening thing in the world is a piece of blank paper in your typewriter? I uh, don't it was know. One of Hemingway or I don't know who it was, <laughs> but uh, but I had I suffered an awful lot of that from, and and I got some help from people who gave me tips. Of, if you're going to write something and you're stuck, start writing anything, no matter how nonsensical. If you've got something then to correct or to work on, and then it begins to unfold and you begin to roll. You know? But if you sit there staring at the blank paper, you're going to be there day after tomorrow doing the same thing, you know, I, putting it off. I had a copywriter actually teach me to just write fee fi fo fum fee fi yeah, fo Yeah, no it's matter how, how nonsensical, start. and then you, then you can correct it. That's a, a track to run on. That, well, that's one tip. I, I don't think... That was that was a challenge to me, and maybe I have had a challenge about uh, about laziness. I've always uh, I've always kind of <laughs> shortcut, and I don't know why. I'm, I find it hard I, to believe you'd be lazy. Well, I, sometimes I think of myself as kind of kind of lazy because do, I. Do you feel accomplished? Uh, accomplished? Yeah. Do you feel well, like what you've done in your life is really you've done? No, I, mean, I could have, have done a lot m more for humanity, maybe, but I do think I had. A, a, I was lucky in having a successful life as far as raising a family and, and making a living. Uh, accomplished, could you could expand that? You know, I would like to go into space. I undoubtedly probably won't now. You know, but you uh, know there is a possibility. You know, <laughs> Richard Branson, who's got these, you know, the the Virgin Galactic. You're thing. right. That's, I'm that's actually good. going to be at the very first launch of the one he's doing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you, yeah, you could you could get into space. I would like to take you if, if, yeah. if you if you're <laughs> up for it. Well, you you fly. I mean, you you, you do fly yeah. planes, so you'd like to go into space. I mean, what yeah, what I'd attracted like to you to flying? Oh, I mean, I'll tell you what it was. I, well, before Pearl Harbor was hit, I was I was taking flying lessons. I had about eight hours in Detroit in a Luscombe Silver, and I was about to solo. And then the World War II came along, and I went into the military and didn't go into the air. Uh, it was the Army Air Corps before the Air Force was right. formed. I wound up in the infantry. But after I got out of the Army and, and as, had established a family, I didn't have the time or the money to go back to training. But in 1962, the Today Show came up. It wasn't even my idea with a, a feature to show how, uh, what it takes to be, get a private pilot's license. So we said, well, we'll pick a young pilot and, and get him. And then one of the writers said, well, why don't, why don't you take the lessons and then we'll show how, and it would identify with the viewer a little more. I thought it was a good idea. So I went at it as a broadcast project. And I got hooked on it because it, once I became a pilot, I really began to garner some ratings and try to do something worth. I don't have an impressive number of hours, <laughs> but I do have a weird assortment of ratings. In addition to single engine land, I have uh, multi engine, boat, air, uh, seaplane, boat, and float, glider, glider tow, hot air balloon. <laughs> I'm a balloon really? pilot. Yeah, I don't. I don't spend much time. I don't own a balloon. But, uh, <laughs> But I've, I've, I've gotten those ratings, and I, and I really enjoyed it. So it, it came about as a broadcast project, as a lot of things that I got interested in were do, I owe to broadcasting. Wow, wow. Well, I mean, that seemed to be your school that you created. Well, all the years of doing it, you maintain such a stellar reputation. I mean, you are a very respected guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you've said a few things that got you in trouble here and there. But for the most part, the public, I mean, they completely look up to you. How did well, you maintain this reputation? I, I know it's, a kind of, it's kind of a limb to be out on, really, you know, but I don't know that I deserve that much of a reputation. Uh, it, it's hard to tell. Something you said reminded me of something, a man who had a reputation of having great judgment uh -huh. was interviewed late in life, and they said, how did you... Uh, how did you get this, this great judgment? And he said, through experience. And the guy said, how did you get the experience? And he said, through bad judgment. Right. <laughs> and that's, so I, I, I don't know, I feel that uh, uh, partly my allegiance to the audience tuned in uh, as a broadcaster. Uh, I think the public, I, I was striving to have the public be sure that I was leveling with them. And maybe that reflects back and they think that that makes me a better person. But. Uh, uh, no, getting back to your idea about being fulfilled, I don't know if uh, 
I, in some ways, I am fulfilled, I think, in, in my life, but I would love to expand it. There, as I say, there are things I'd yet like to do. Right. Like to write the great American novel, which I'm pretty sure I won't. <laughs> I you know, I, 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 there is a possibility. I, I believe if you put your mind to it, you probably, you, you'd, you'd at least get yeah, close. Yeah, I'd love to be able to write, like, to me, the favorite novel I ever read was Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove. I don't know how many people have read that or saw the CBS version of the, for a television series. That was really well done. It was about Dove. the American West, and it was done as literature and not as a dime novel the uh, Western stuff. Right. Well, um, geez. In all the times that you were interviewing different people and stuff, how did you handle situations where you were just opposed to someone's opinion or just didn't consider them a, a, a nice person or a flat out evil? I mean, how did you, were you still able to communicate with them and document stuff for your listeners and at the same time, you know, not jump across the table and want to smack somebody. Yeah, no, I never, I never felt like losing my temper. But some, there were some people whose uh, what they had to say was so disrespectful that in my mind that, uh, well, I can tell you one. Many years ago, I interviewed uh, George Wallace, and I find he said something that was so outrageous that I knew our listeners would. Uh, would know how awful it was. So why should I? Why should I pile on? You know, the, I, I just looked at him for a while, and then I looked into the camera and didn't say anything. And later, later NBC <laughs> crossed me on that. They said, you know, that was a comment. And I said, no, I didn't say anything. They said, the lift of an eyebrow is a comment. That was their attitude. You know? Interesting. But I said, well, I'll lift my eyebrow when I think you know, there's something is really ridiculous, or, you know, a preposterously racist statement like that. Right. So, but. Uh, I, I don't know, in, in doing <laughs> interviews generally, it took me a long time to realize how simple interviewing is. Do you know what it is? If you and I didn't know each other at all from a load right. of coal, and, you're, and we're suddenly in a studio and there are 25 million people tuned in now, and I don't know anything about it, I could do an interview with you, and here's how simple it is. I would start by saying, who are you and why am I talking to you? Now, you presumably know the answer to that. And then I would ask, run down a list of words, who, what, where, when, why, how, how much, you know, listening to your answers and getting right. the next question from your answers. And you could build an interview without knowing anything about what you're, uh, about the person to start with. And isn't, I think that's a remarkably simple thing. Well, let's, let's, let's break this down again yeah. because I think this would be so valuable to our listeners. Me being in the marketing business and communications, which is you're an expert in, which I think any effective marketing is simply just effective communication, um, that's a process that you just described there. So if someone has to sit down and talk to somebody, it could be watched on television yeah. or it just simply could be you want to get to know someone. What, let's go through that again. So yeah. you, you, how did, how did you uh, break it down? Well, on a television interview, the, the who would not, you wouldn't do that for reasons of politeness. Right. I would presumably know who you are and be able to say something gracious about you like you said about me at the beginning of, of it. So you uh, eliminate that. But once you've got that, the others are, are uh, all you need, really. You don't need to know the subject about which, if you're an expert on something, I don't need to know your expertise in order to interview. Exactly. Now, I'll give you an example of how that happened one time. NBC had a, a thing called the Wisdom Series, and they had interviewed uh, Sean O'Casey, uh, the poet Robert Frost, uh -huh. and everything. And in each case, they would get somebody in the same field to interview them. And they were bad interviews, really. And they were, uh, they were coming up to Frank Lloyd Wright, and somebody, a, a, a Chicago producer at NBC, made the suggestion because they, they said, well, I'll find a young architect to interview Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said, why not, let's not use an architect, why not use an interviewer instead? And so they asked me to do it. And that was, a, I really enjoyed that. Wright only did two television interviews, one with Mike Wallace and one with me. Wow. And that's in the, in the archives. But I, but I remember that I didn't know architecture, so I asked the naive questions that you need to ask so that he can give his, his answers. And that gets away from the idea that you have to know. It, it supports my idea you can do an interview without really knowing anything about the, the subject. My, I mean, my experience, and, and in many cases, it served me well not to know anything about the person I'm yes, interviewing because I'm, I'm simply asking questions that I'm curious yeah. about. And yeah. I think of, well, would my audience, would my listeners, would my viewers want to hear this? Yeah. And I simply just ask questions that I think would be interesting. That, that's smart. You know, the astronomer Harlow Shapley was a guest on the old Tonight Show when Jack Parr had it. 
And Parr asked a wonderful question. He said, uh, you're an astronomer and you've turned telescopes on all directions of the sky. He said, is there a God? And Shapley then spent the next four or five minutes explaining his theology, whatever it was. I, I don't remember exactly. But I thought that was a wonderful question to ask, you know, right. instead of asking, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, about uh, prisms for breaking down light or distances to galaxies or whatever. He asked a question that was really right on for the audience. I thought it was good. Wow, wow. So, I mean, um, you're a pretty social guy. I mean, were you, uh, do you consider yourself an introvert, an extrovert? I mean, you ever thought about that? Slightly introverted, I think, yeah. I don't, uh, I, I've only known one real extrovert in my life, and that was Ethel Merman. You remember, she was a big star. Most people in showbiz who appear to be extrovert are really introverts who are who are throwing up some armor that's uh, that's extroversion. And that's an interesting point. And they're hiding an introverted thing, but not Ethel Merman. She was. We were talking one time on a, <laughs> so, a, a there was a television special we were both on for some charity, and in uh, break time we were talking about stage fright. And right. She said, "I've never understood that." She says, "What? Well, what is stage fright?" And I said, "Well, you know, they're on stage and people may have paid to get in and." And it's scary. And she said, well, what, what's scary? Are you afraid the audience is going to storm the stage and do you bodily harm? Wow. I said, no. And she said, well, then what's to be afraid of? Just and no I fear. believe her. I think she was a true extrovert. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. To, to even say something like that, that's, well, I mean, I remember the first time I actually did any public speaking, I was, it was nerve wracking. I was sweating bullets. Yeah, me too. Was, oh, it was, but I did it because yeah. my philosophy is anything that you fear and you don't face controls you. Anything that you fear, but you take steps. It's that is can... so wise. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. If you if you are afraid of something, then dive into it and confront it because uh, you're not going to do yourself any good by just hiding all the time. Absolutely. And, and I think part of, you know, accomplishment is getting out of your comfort zone, going out there and doing things. I mean, one of the yeah. gauges are if I'm a little afraid of it, I kind of know. Uh, that I'm moving in the right direction because it's pushing me up against my self-imposed limitations and I always want to want to break through so That's good advice yeah. you know, one thing I want to ask you I mean you certainly have had to sit down with did you ever get nervous sitting down with the president or talking to someone or how did you well, I've always been a little bit nervous you don't want to be too nervous it derails you but if you're right. if you're utterly unnervous you're not likely to do as good a job as if you got a little adrenaline going you know, to to uh, to help you be alert right so yes, I've, I've been a little nervous, and maybe more with some than with others. Uh, toward the end, the last few decades, really, I haven't, I haven't been nervous about either being on the air or who I'm talking to, but I may feel alert and respectful of you know, talking to a, a president or, or somebody like that. How, how do you deal with difficult people? Oh, this is interesting. One time we, we had, a, oh, we had an awful, another awful guy on with the, he wore a, uh, red, white, and he had red, white, and blue shoes, and uh, he was uh, farther right than anything you can imagine. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in the, this interview live on the Today Show, he said, uh, "I said uh, something about uh, poor people. I don't know what it was." And he said, "There are no poor people in America." I said, "There are no poor people in America." He said, "No." I said, "There are a few uh, Arawak Indians and Eskimos that are too lazy to work." And I thought, "Oh boy." <laughs> Well, how do I deal with this? Right. And I didn't. I thanked him and dismissed him and went to a commercial. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> because did that you, was, did that you was the only. Up? I didn't want. To, I didn't really want to have anything to do with the guy. And you know, I had. I had to get rid of it. And I had some words with the person who had booked him, <laughs> as you can guess. But there, that very seldom happened. But uh, what is yeah. what is some memorable stuff that's happened on the air, either extraordinarily, insanely crazy or embarrassing <laughs> that you think are just always have stuck in your mind. One that was embarrassing because you can't joke your way out of a religious thing. And I had a, a, a it was a charming story really, a, a, a group of Kalmuk Buddhists who had fled the banks of the Don River uh, under uh, Stalin mm -hmm. and they fled to Germany at the time Hitler was rising, which wasn't a great place to flee to. And they finally then fled from there and made it to New Jersey and they put up a temple that had been there ever since. And the story was they were going to move the stones of the temple back to the banks of the Don because it was now safe to do. It's a right. charming story, really. So this was live on, on the Today Show, and they sent a, a, a priest and a translator. 
And they get there in the morning. Now, dig this. I, I asked the first question. I did a little layup. I asked the first question, and the priest smiled at me and nodded and everything. And, and I thought, well, maybe he didn't. And I looked at the translator. I thought, I, maybe he didn't ask that. So I re-asked the question a little more clearly. And I got smiles and nods, and that was all. And I went to another question, and the same thing happened. And then I, I put out my knowledge of Kalmuk Buddhism, which took about 11 seconds, right. and, and asked another question, and I got nothing. And finally, I was sweating and thinking, is this April 1st? And they've set me up you know, for some kind right, of right. April Fool joke. And finally, I had to dismiss them. And, and I went to a commercial, and I, I said, what was going on? And you know what, what did that? The translator in the middle of the night was taken ill, and he didn't want to disappoint us, so he sent his brother, who didn't speak both languages. Oh, my God. <laughs> had a complete language barrier on a live network program. And that, that made me sweat, because it wasn't, you know, a religious thing you can't joke your way out of. Right. And I just had to terminate it. But that was unmemorable. Well, when you have to terminate something like that, what do you do with the time? I mean, how, oh, do you, do you, do you well, ever find I, he, I hid behind the time I could go to the next commercial and then figure out what to do in the, and maybe discuss it if necessary later. And try, try, I, because I found out what it was, I could explain to the audience why it, uh, why that happened, and and do so with <laughs> maintain some shred of dignity. Right. But uh, but that was the uh, yeah that was the, we used to have those five minute periods where the local people come in and about eighty stations dumped out. We still had to fill the time for those stations that didn't do something locally. Right. And we used to have fun with that because we, uh, we, they didn't show in Washington or New York, so the, our bosses weren't watching. And one time Barbara Walters and I were talking, and it was subject came, she called me a wasp. Oh, really? And I, I, said, uh, <laughs> I said, you know what wasp means? And she said, yeah, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. I said, well, I'm not white, first of all, because nobody is. I said, secondly, I'm not Anglo-Saxon, I'm Celtic. And I said, third, I'm not Protestant, I'm a Buddhist. And I, know, I said, why did I say that? I'm going to get hate mail or something. And he did. And and so uh, yeah, well, I, I did get a little weird mail at, for, for a time, but uh, it was, that's the kind of thing we like to, to do with those five-minute things. So, I mean, network time. I, I imagine having to tap dance is an art and a science once you... And, you know, filling a minute or a minute and a quarter is a lot tougher than filling five minutes. Because five minutes, you can develop some kind of a thing. But if you've got a minute and a quarter to discuss, when television satellites first came up, who, who was, I forget the guy in the Congress, that voted in favor of making them commercial, and he, he swung the vote, instead of making them purely government. Right. And that was a wise decision. And somebody asked me, uh, uh, Oh, I know they asked whether uh, what was NBC's attitude toward that, uh -huh. and because NBC was owned by RCA, and I said at that time General Sarnoff was still in charge, of, and I remember saying on the air because I had such a short time to deal with this, I said I don't know what NBC or RCA's attitude is, and I said it doesn't matter to me because they have no influence on what my attitude is, and then, and I thought no, I've just ended my career. <laughs> I thought, you know, and I got a letter, I uh, got a, a phone call from Sarnoff's office that he wanted to compliment me on saying that because he was trying to prove that he, he wasn't dictating the policies that go on the broadcasting network. Oh, uh, that's was, funny. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's good. But I had to establish the fact that I wasn't under the influence of, of any big corporation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you were, I imagine people in reporting are constantly, I don't know if bribe is the right word, but there, there's constantly people trying to influence them with their agendas. How do you deal with that? I, I, I think so. And, that's, and some weird things came out of that because one, one time, way back in the early 60s, Boeing wanted to buy time, and at that time, today was really watched by by Washington, right. you know, the the Congress and the, uh, everything, and the White House. Lyndon Johnson used to call up after a thing to compliment some guest or to raise hell of why we had had somebody on. He did that a lot. Wow. And so Boeing had that. We had this big thing for doing the Boeing commercials, and they suddenly quit. They suddenly bombed out, and they weren't going to do it. And we found out the reason was. They didn't want to be accused of going on the Today Show to influence the legislation <laughs> that might affect them. And we lost the account because of that, which was kind of flattering to their idea of what our influence might have been. Uh, but you're right, there is a lot of influence, although never has a network said to me, we want you to soft pedal this or right. promote this. They never have said that. I, I'll give them that credit. And I don't think they've done it to any of the major newscasters in the, in the, in the network. Well, you, you know, the whole term spin. I mean, how would you define yeah. spin? What isn't does that it, actually mean? Isn't that a marvelous thing? It's, it's to put a, 
to put a complexion on something, a good example of spin might be if you had a stadium for 20,000 people and only 5,000 showed up, uh -huh. and then you, you can put your cameras where the 5,000 show up, you've got a big crowd, you know. If you show an empty stadium, virtually empty stadium, that, that is spinning it in a different direction, you know. Right. So that you can take a fact and, and give it as a fact, but you can do it in a way, either verbally or visually, that puts spin on it. And that's a, a, a very useful thing to politicians. Oh, absolutely. Well, now, you know the term, you know, don't believe what you read, don't believe the news. Yeah. I mean, to what extent should someone believe or not believe the news? To a great extent in the details. In the main thing, if somebody says there was a train wreck in Georgia this morning, that's either true or not true. You know? Right. But if, if you start taking into account spin and those other things, then you shouldn't just believe everything as, as it's presented because it might be presented in a way that, that uh, pretends to be objective and is, and is not. You know? Right. Well, did, did, you, did you find yourself a lot in your career watching the news or watching television and just thinking this is complete BS? I mean, yeah, did, did yeah. You know, I, mentioned, I mentioned, you know, I, I admired uh, CNN, the way Turner got that going and, and stuck with it for a long time. And I stayed with it until, and lately they've come back a lot, but once after, right after Turner was gone, they did some things I thought were way off base. And I'll give you an example. At the 2004 election, before that uh, occurred, right before, right. I was having breakfast and this anchor said, uh, when we come back, we have a feature on the new voting machines. And then, so I thought, well, I'm gonna stay for that. Because we know from voting machines, uh, you know, four years ago, they came back and they threw it to this guy, I forget who it was, who was standing in front of a voting machine and he said, oh, these new machines are, and he talked about how user friendly they were, how they were going to help them. And I thought, well, come on, get to the story. And he, and he finally wound up and threw it back to the anchor. I said, he missed the story because the story was not how wonderful they are. The story is how awful they are, right. you know, how, how potentially dangerous for electoral fraud and everything. And I thought, why would CNN uh, lose out on that? They, they've corrected a lot of that now, but uh, that was a matter of spin that I thought was awful. You know, it was yeah. an example of a, and of course people who didn't know might just accept that as, you know, voting machines are wonderful. Well, I, um, what makes good television versus what makes bad television? I mean, you've been news reporter, but you've—I mean—you really kind of understand the whole communication. Good, view. yeah. Good television has to be engaging, and then useful to the person tuned in, where it's going to help his life in some way, and and, and as truthful as possible, so it isn't just pie in the sky. Uh, one of the things I was kind of proud to be associated with—I was talked in I, about nine years ago. I had my—I had ruined my knees, and I had my knees replaced. You know, both. Um, I'm ashamed that I don't have a Heisman Trophy to show for ruined knees, yeah. but it was just a series of dumb accidents you know, <laughs> that caused it. And I was going. I said to Barbara Walters right before I went to the hospital to do that. I said, "Don't, don't lie and say I'm on vacation. Just say I'm away." And I like, right. That conversation was overheard by the executive producer, who said, "Why don't you go public with that and show what's involved in knee surgery?" And they talked me into it, and I, it was one of the best things I ever did because I still get letters from people who say that they saw that, what we covered, and they had the courage then to go ahead and, and uh, change their life because they got their knees fixed and they were all right. People who were afraid to do it. And I felt really good about, about doing that. You know, it was a, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to think that as, me, as much time that you've been on television, uh, the millions of people that have listened to your words and, and heard you, how much influence you actually have as an individual in that environment. On occasion, there was real influence, and uh, that I'm very happy and very proud of. Even though I had to be talked into that one, I wasn't going to go public with it. But, but I'm glad I did now because almost everybody I talked to who, who went ahead. Oh, uh, the reason I went ahead with it was, I knew my knees were ruined, and I thought, man, do I really want that surgery? And then I saw on a cable channel. A guy who had had that surgery, both knees replaced at the same time, went back to his occupation, which was rodeo work. Really? And I thought, if he can do it, I can do it. No <laughs> doubt. And and I did because and, you know after that replacement, I was in 13 days. I was back on the air in the studio because I figured if I could sit and watch television for an hour, I could sit and do television for an hour. That's funny. And in in a few weeks, I was uh, I was walking in without with a cane and whatnot. 
And in about seven months, I could run upstairs, which I hadn't done for 12 years before because my knees were so bad. You know? wow. Isn't that amazing? So I knew it was a good thing for people to do if they needed it. And uh, having, oh, then if I, if I met anybody who had compromised results and didn't like what they got, I would say, did you do the exercise regimen that they told you? And they said, well, I was supposed to, but it was too, uh, un too inconvenient or too painful or something. And then they get a leg that they can't quite straighten and they can't bend very far, you know? Yeah. And that, so it's very important if you're gonna do, do knee replacement to do the exercises they tell you. I still do those exercises. Well, well there you go. Well, let's talk about business ethics because oh, I'd, like okay. I'd like to get your perspectives on this. I mean, the, the, I went on 2020, the, uh, the, the very last year that you actually, yeah, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the last month that you mm -hmm. uh, worked there, and Barbara October. Walters, yeah, right. October 99, and Barbara Walters uh, did the story, and at the time, Arnold Diaz, the investigative reporter, and we did a story mm -hmm. on how to basically not get ripped off by a professional carpet and upholstery cleaning company using bait and switch advertising. And that, they ended up putting uh, ethicalservices.com on the ABC website, and it created this idea that I had of, if I could link consumers to service businesses that want to provide a criteria of, of, of ethics, you know, guaranteeing their work, uh, carrying proper That's insurance, true. employing people, and not having them do any sort of high pressure selling to make a livable wage, um, you know, uh, agreeing to never use any dishonest or misleading mm -hmm. advertising, that it would be a great way for consumers to find those people. And, and there's so much, as a marketer for what I do uh, for a living, you know, the number one question in consumers' minds is who can I trust? And so I always want to do everything I can to, to teach my clients to convey trust and obviously t to live that. Mm -hmm. And t because Dan Sullivan, my good friend, he says uh, money earned ethically is a byproduct of value creation. And so I always think about when you're out there being an entrepreneur, when you're out there doing things, create value, and you get paid for the value you create. And if you don't create value for other people, then you're not really providing a service, you're taking advantage of people. And that has everything to do with, with character. I mean, you, sure. you know, it's not, a, it's not a gimmick, it's not a technique, it's, it's literally how you conduct yourself and how you treat other people. And so I wanted to get your thoughts, uh, because you had to face that on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, your own character representing you know the different medias but it was you it was your face that was out there and in, in trying to serve the audience what are your thoughts on on business ethics communication that sort of Joe, thing? there was such a need for what you then provided because of, of communication that was untrustworthy it might it might be an honest company that you could trust but how do you how do you know right uh, I tried to do that in my personal career but you codified it in a way that has, uh, was so much needed that's why you that's why it was very successful, I think, because people want to know, can I, can I trust this person or not? Um, I, I don't know. It's admirable how you, how you did codify it and turn it into something that, that could become a, a reality on a very wide scale. Right. I tried to do it on a personal scale, I think, just by making sure people understood that I meant what I said and that I wouldn't associate myself with something that was, uh, uh, that was shady or, or wrong. Yeah. And I had a funny experience on that one time when uh, there was a, a, a sponsor on the Tonight Show, the old Tonight Show, that made a, thing, a linoleum like floor covering. And it wasn't right, really, because nails would come up through it and stuff. And, uh, and I, I said, I won't do this anymore. And they said, You're in breach of contract because you're supposed to do the commercials. I said, right. No, I won't, I won't have anything to do with it. I thought maybe that would damage my. But the, the net result was I, I was more in demand afterward, you know, than, than I would have been if I had gone ahead and done it. But I couldn't live with that and, and say the things they wanted me to say about it. So I, I made that attempt to do it, on, but it never occurred to me to put it together in a way like, like you did and make it into a, a really widespread uh, entity. Well, you know, my, one of my goals is to transform the way that Americans actually buy and locate service companies because you've got all these wonderful companies, but they simply don't know how to get the message out. And then you've got all these consumers that want things and they just want to find the right company. And if I could Boy, help you. develop a system where people can find people they can trust and people that are trustworthy and are willing to put their butts on the line because people have the ability to report on them, I think it will just provide a, a tremendous that's, service. That it, is marvelous. It is what I wanted, too, because I thought, you know, if I need to use a painter, if I need to you know, use anyone, and I simply could figure out a way to find them 
and eliminate the possibility of getting ripped off or dealing with the company? How, how good of a value would that be to me? And then I thought, you know, that'd be a good value to everyone. Tell me something. Do you think in the world of finance now, with Bernie Madoff and, and this kind of thing, would there be a way of, of uh, in, investors finding out about whether somebody's got a Ponzi scheme going or, or whether that uh, is there some is that going to happen I, I, you know I think so I, I recently uh, read a survey where 98 percent of high net worth individuals when asked would they refer their current financial advisor or planner 90 uh, out of hundred percent ninety eight percent said they would not they would not they would not and, Boy, and, and, and now this is I don't know if it, it applies to all across the board financial yeah. planners but for high net worth individuals and if you sit and think about it how much distrust do people have so I, I think ultimately it comes down to literally asking the people who do you in, in creating a vehicle yeah. of communication where they can give feedback I think there could be an ethical services dot com version for every sort of business Very but good. it would require not the person who's the marketer or the whoever saying we're the best but actually asking the real people that are yeah, whether they try yeah. exactly That's That's creating a vehicle for that yeah. I think ultimately with when it comes to sharing valuable things with uh, consumers and how they make decisions I think ultimately one new new thing that is happening with technology with the internet is there's a guy I interviewed named Rod Beckstrom and he's one of the co-authors of a book called uh, the spider and the starfish and the the analogy is that if you cut off the head of a spider the spider dies if you cut off the arm of a starfish the starfish will grow another arm and certain species of starfish will grow uh, if you chop the starfish into pieces it will grow an entirely new starfish and so the, the point was a, a centralized organism versus versus a decentralized organism. Oh, easy. And so the, the the concept was that things like Wikipedia, you know, like someone types in Hugh Downs, they can find information. Not always always accurate, but right. with anyone. I mean they can find and you've got uh, right now as we sit here and do this interview, there's literally tens of thousands of people not getting paid working on building this starfish called Wikipedia <laughs> or Google has aspects or Craigslist. Uh, you know, and one of the things he said is that uh, like Al Qaeda is actually a starfish. You 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 kill you know Bin Laden or you kill some and of that's the, not going to end. Up. It doesn't it doesn't end. Twelve step groups is actually a starfish. There was a catalyst uh, named Bill W and Dr Bob that in the 1930s uh, found a solution to people dealing with alcoholism. You know prior to that there was no people either were you know yeah. institutionalized or died or just were, suffered from this uh, condition uh, of addiction but that was a starfish and so I think w uh, what is happening um, today if you look at a lot of the things that technology gives us an opportunity are certain movements they just expand because they, they and it can work in both ways it could be very negative a very negative yeah. starfish or it could be very positive and so I think with the current events of what's happening is as long as there's a catalyst that creates positive change that it and it becomes it just grows and mm -hmm. and I think it will grow not from a CEO in the future I think it will be large groups of people and I hope that's the positive thing that comes out of that it that makes a lot of sense and that's why yeah, I want I ethical services to be I want it to be a starfish yeah. so it's not like me saying here's what Joe Polish or my company thinks is you know ethical it's like here's how here's a criteria and you and the consumers build on that criteria and then the consumers own it it's not that's how I really that shows a faith in human nature that, that yeah. the uh, fascist mind doesn't have Fa right. fascist mind believes that humans are intrinsically evil mm -hmm. and they need to be governed you know by by some dictator or something but if you have faith in human nature is wonderful and because no in in the news business we say good news is no news you know right. uh, and the, I guess there's a reason for that because you don't if you've got uh, uh, if you've got a, a charming news story it's, it's really not much news unless it's unusual or tragic or something right. uh, we we tend to think that humans because of that uh, are bad because you, you focuses on the bad deeds of certain people right. but if there hadn't been a countervailing force since before history began uh, of cooperation and empathy and, and everything, we'd still be in caves uh, eating raw meat, you know. Absolutely. So, so the human na humans are basically good, and we've got to deal with the part of them that isn't so good, 
but you've got to have faith in it. And I think that's what you are displayed with that star, the starfish idea, I think, is, right. shows the humans. And if you believe that, then there's, there's a lot of hope for humanity if you can build things on that instead of building them on the fascist uh, approach. Well, absolutely. You know, it's about evolving versus devolving, which, by yeah. the way, let me ask you about yeah. that because I wrote something down here where you talk about the anti-evolution mindset oh, that yeah. you currently believe is, you know, infecting our culture. And uh, could you talk about, first off, what is that? And yeah. yeah. At first, I thought it was just a function of the fundamentalist religious view. Uh -huh. It goes much deeper than that. It, it, uh, forget the religion for a moment. There is something in some humans that is viscerally opposed to being related to any other species of animal. They'll talk, talk about humans and animals. They don't want to say that we're animals. We are, you know. Uh, we may be a unique animal in, in intellect and some other ways. Uh, and I, I think a, a very significant animal in the, in the universe. Could, for the first time, the reins of evolution are in our hands now. We have control over uh, every other species on this planet is here by our sufferance now and can, and can be extinguished if we allow that to, to happen. Uh, and we are not only, the universe, it's a, to me it's as though the universe has not only uh, uh, gone into the idea of finding out about itself, but manipulating itself, because we can right. manipulate the environment. Yeah. This is an awesome responsibility. But we are still animals. And I think there are people who are so upset at the idea of being related to any of the great apes that, this, that they've got to reject Darwin, because that would just be an awful thought to them. And uh, the religious right has tended to uh, adopt that view. They right. think it's not biblical and whatnot. But uh, it's a very potent force that you have to deal with. And it, 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 it's part of an anti-science, anti-intellectual movement that is a reality. I think it's, it's, uh, it can be done in. But there's a lot of movement against the use of the human mind. It's a kind of a know-nothing, neo-Luddite approach to life right. that they think will make humans more comfortable, but it really will keep us in the dark if we do that. We've got to respect science and follow a scientific method, which doesn't preclude religious faith at all. That's apples and oranges, you know. Uh, but I think that, to me, the, the anti-evolution movement is the spear point of that, of that awful idea that is a fear of being related to other animals. Interesting. Well, do, do you do you believe in karma? Not in the strict sense. I, I I think there's a lot to a lot of those things that have Hindu roots and everything. That but I don't subscribe to karma in the sense that if you uh, uh, that in some afterlife you're going to build, have built up uh, your credit things or debit. Right. Right. I, I don't think that. But I think there's. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said for some of the philosophy that's come out of the East that way. Well, and the reason I ask is is not even really necessarily on a, 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 a very deep spiritual level. Uh, more so, it's just you've always stri uh, strike me as someone that just is a friendly, nice, caring person. And I, one of my my, my favorite sayings I heard years ago is is be nice to the people you meet on the way up because they're going to be the same people you meet on the way down. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. And, and I think it's just a good way to conduct your life because you know, frankly, we don't always make good decisions. We make mistakes yeah. as human beings. We screw up at times. And to go out and try to make your way through life by stepping on people, being rude, taking, you know, people that don't say, you know, uh, thank you to waiters and they, they, they look down at people. You know, I just, I think people like that are jerks and there's, there's no reason yeah. for it. And you've just conducted yourself, it seems, and again, uh, this is the Joe Polish perspective of a few downs, but I think it's a lot, I think the public uh, perceives you this way. And I'm, I'm really kind of wanting to find out as we wrap up here, you know, maybe uh, what are some philosophies on how you've lived life and how you do that so that people, I, I think a lot of people would like to lead their life with people liking them, mm. meeting them, growing, evolving. One of the things I learned, Joe, that was, and it has worked for me, I don't, I never, I, I can't say never, but in the last decades of my career, I never competed with anybody. I'll compete with my own past record or something, but I, and I found when I didn't compete, if I was helpful to some, somebody, they were going to do a feature on. Uh, I'm a scuba diver, and I used to teach scuba diving in the 50s and everything, and, and uh, they were going to do something, and, and I've done some diving things on on 2020 and so forth, and uh, uh, I can't remember who it was now wanted to do a diving thing, and they said, well, you, that kind of compete with what you're. I said, no, it won't. If I help. It, and so I, my inclination was to help this person and, and make, having him make a good showing. And I found a long time ago that 
if I'm helpful to people, they're going to be helpful to me, and that's that's the only way I'm going to rise, you know, and not not trying to climb on them and, and get someplace. So that has worked for me, and maybe it would work for for just about everybody. Abandon the idea of competition, except against your own record. You know, I think first off, I think that's great advice, and secondly, you know, what I take out of that, what I instantly thought of when you said that, is is comparing yourself to others. You know, that's the surefire way to to be miserable. <laughs> Isn't that true? Because yeah. there's always going to be someone who has it better, and there's always going to be someone who has it worse. So it's part like of it, the yacht, yacht owners. You know, a guy finally gets a hundred foot yacht, and then he's moored behind. It. A guy that has a 125-foot yacht and he's miserable. <laughs> Is that hysterical? It's, yeah. it's so funny. Well, you know, first off, there's there's so many more things I I, I could ask you. I'd love to ask you, but I want to I want to wrap up here. Um, to the listeners, um, most of them being entrepreneurs and business owners, a lot of them dealing with enormous struggle, but they're big risk takers and they're out there trying to just do stuff. And anyone that would even take the time to educate themselves, watch our interview, things like that, are genuinely interested in learning. And I wanted to see if any, uh, there's been a school of communication that's uh, been named after you and, and you're out there doing a lot of stuff. Uh, what uh, like words of advice would you give to, uh, to business owners and to just people of, uh, of America just to go out and, and, and have a better life and do good things? I mean, parting words, I would say. I'd say one thing would be that, uh, that they should pay attention to what you have set up in the way of making sure that if they're honestly run business that the public knows that they're an honestly run business and and through what you've set up that that has now become possible they should support that kind of a of a view um, that's kind of topmost in my mind as, uh, as to what the the other thing would just be to uh, n not lose patience because some things take time right and um, you can you know drive drive ahead, but don't get into such high gear that you're going to flail yourself to pieces. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have any concise advice on that, except that one point, which I think is important to be sure the public knows that they have a way of knowing whether you're worth it or not. Right. Right. And, Great. Well, yes. and, and also, I, what I want to do, I probably should have done this in the very beginning of the, uh, the interview, is acknowledge uh, Brian Kurtz and Margie Abrams and uh, Marty people. Edelston, all the wonderful people at Boardroom Inc., which have been my friends for over a decade. And they're the ones that really uh, introduced me to you, and we made the connection. And, and I, first off, I just want to really sincerely thank you. You're such a busy guy, even with all the things you're doing, and you took the time to come down the studio and do a, this. It really was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And, thank I, and you I hope know. in the future we can do it again. And if there's anything Never related been. That, that Hugh Downs does when we uh, publish uh, this uh, this video uh, interview, I will put it on our website at geniusnetwork.com and keep you abreast of all of the cool things that Hugh is doing. And any right. famous last words? I don't. Uh, outside, outside of the guy who said uh, in closing, I would like to say goodbye, which is something seldom said by somebody who starts with in closing. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> no, I, I've enjoyed it very much. I don't have anything to add. All right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate uh, it.